We will take our reading from words from our blessed Lord himself as he spoke to the great visionary, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the saint of the sacred heart. Our Lord said, Behold the heart which has loved men so much and which is loved by them so little. I promise you that my heart will expand in order to pour down abundant blessings on those who will honor it and apply their zeal to make it honored by others. Again, words taken from our dearest Lord to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On January 24th, in the year 1849, a man named James Wilson Marshall found flakes of gold in a place called Sutter's Mill, right near present-day Sacramento, California. And when Mr. Marshall recalled finding these flakes of gold, he said to himself, It made my heart thump, for I was certain that it was gold. News of such riches to be found out west brought many people to the famous California gold rush, where 49ers came to the golden stage in the year 1849. Men and families from western territories, men from the east coast, people from as far away as Mexico, Peru, and even China, traveled towards California looking for wealth. Altogether, miners extracted some 750,000 pounds of gold during the California gold rush. Now, as we know from the Holy Gospels, the Roman centurion, a man named St. Longinus, while he was near the foot of the cross on Good Friday, opened the sacred side and the most sacred heart of Christ. And we know from sacred scripture, the inerrant truth, that at once, once that side was opened, once that heart was opened, most precious blood and a miraculous stream of crystal clean water flowed forth from that heart as a treasury of infinite satisfaction, of graces, and of salvation for mankind. Using his spear, St. Longinus opened up, if you will, a gold mine for humanity in the heart of our Lord, and rich veins of spiritual gold and silver can be found in that sacred organ. And all who dig into sacred heart devotions can find rich deposits of mystical wealth. In this immeasurable and infinite mine shaft, there is an abyss of all virtues, the litany tells us. There are treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's a fountain of life and holiness. And yes, there's mercy, propitiation for our sins, salvation itself. And it will enrich all those who call upon the most sacred heart of Jesus. Striking it rich and laying claim to true wealth is not to be found buried deep in the earth, but rather within our dearest Lord, who is divine wisdom become flesh, divine wisdom become incarnate. Now, in the year 1674, a visitation nun, whom I mentioned earlier, a visitation nun named Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque, received special visions and messages from our dearest Lord. While in adoration before the most blessed of all sacraments, Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque saw our Lord coming towards her on a cloud, with his left hand pointing towards her, and yes, his right hand and index finger pointing towards his heart, which was exposed for her to see. The heart of Christ that the nun saw had a crown of thorns around it, as well as a cross and fire, a furnace of fire coming forth from the top and addressing her and also pointing to the treasure chest of his sacred heart. Jesus spoke those words which are both consoling but also challenging and even condemning to us. Behold the heart which has loved men so very much, but has received so little love in return. 
The Sacred Heart of Jesus is the greatest masterpiece of the Holy Ghost, for it is, as the litany tells us, the tabernacle of the Most High God, in whom dwelleth divinity corporally. It is the heart of the best of all masters. It is the heart of the most tender of all fathers. It is the heart of the most sincere of any friend you've ever had. It was and is the heart of Jesus that showed goodness and patience towards those annoying apostles. It was that heart that wept literally at the tomb of Lazarus. And it was that heart that consoled the sisters of Lazarus, St. Martha and St. Mary Magdalene. And yes, it was the heart of Christ that was most merciful to those who were fallen and penitents, especially the Samaritan woman at the well, and yes, the good thief on Mount Calvary, St. Dismas. This is the God with the heart of gold, who descended from the brightness of his glory to the miserable condition of our fallen humanity to be humiliated and, yes, debased in order to lift us up to a throne which he has called us to sit upon in the heights above. And he devoted himself to all kinds of suffering in order to provide for us riches, riches of eternal happiness. The Son of God then founded his church, his one true Catholic church, so that his heart would abide with us all days. And he willed that his sacred flesh, his most precious blood, would be our food and our drink. And it would be with us for all time until the very end. And yet, despite all these riches buried deep within the heart of our Savior, men still seek what they call precious metals and precious gems, which in comparison is just fool's gold and costume jewelry. Fallen men will leave home, they'll leave family for mere earthly riches, they will mortgage their future for a shiny object, perhaps they'll even forfeit their eternal salvation for a treasure they can't even take with them when they die. Yes, they dig into a, a mine, into this earth, which the Bible says is going to burn away, engulfed in flame at the end. Behold the heart that has loved men so much, but has received so little love in return. But for those who wish to stake a claim on heavenly riches, the mine shaft of the heart of Christ is still opened. And for those who desire to dig into the mysteries of his heart, for those who are willing to make loving acts of reparation to that heart which has been wounded by man's ingratitude, true and lasting riches await them. Spiritual miners who practice First Friday devotion so important First Friday devotions are given infallible, unfailing guarantees by Christ, who is the truth. For those who make the First Fridays, for those who receive Holy Communion and participate in pious devotions to the Sacred Heart on the first Friday of the month for at least nine consecutive months, they are guaranteed spiritual riches, namely those 12 promises given by the sacred heart of Christ. And who wouldn't want these promises fulfilled? One of the promises says this, all the graces you need, all the necessary graces you require for your state in life. You want to be a good father, good mother, a good priest? Have devotion to the sacred heart and you will be given the graces for your state in life. Peace in your families is another guarantee. Who wouldn't want that? And yes, the Sacred Heart will be a refuge for you in your final hour as you were about to die. We should want that. And yes, the Sacred Heart devotions make tepid souls fervent. It provides sinners with an, with an ocean of mercy. And yes, it makes fervent souls perfect. Sacred Heart devotions. Who would not want to obtain these promises? Now, while enduring his most holy passion upon the holy wood of the cross, our blessed Lord bled, the Bible says. 
His most sacred heart was pierced and opened, and his precious blood flowed out in abundance. But although Christ may not be bleeding anymore from his physical body, from his physical sacred veins, his mystical body, which is only the Roman Catholic Church, is enduring bleeding. She is hemorrhaging as we speak. There have been more martyrs in the history of the 20th century than all the other centuries combined in the Catholic Church. A French priest once said the following. This French priest said, quote, It is a law that the church cannot take a step forward except at the cost of the life of her children. This priest then continued, To establish her rights, the church must let her blood flow in streams. Her spouse, Jesus Christ, purchased the church with his blood. And she, the church, must purchase his grace at a similar cost. Blood. Our dearest Lord did say in the Gospels, didn't he? Didn't he say, no servant is greater than his master? If the God-man, Jesus Christ, laid down his life on the cross to bring about the work of redemption, then the members of Holy Church must mortify themselves, die to self, die to their disordered will, crucify the old Adam, crucify the old Eve within us, and yes, perhaps even shed blood. Shed blood as disciples of Christ and members of his mystical body. Although certainly a high price to pay, such bloodletting does purify the world. It calls down divine mercy from above. It spreads the fruits of redemption to individual souls. And it makes the kingdom of Christ bigger and stronger. Since we have the famous maxim which goes back almost to the very beginning of the church, the blood of martyrs is the seed of future Christians. Now, the first socialist and atheistic revolution did not occur in Bolshevik Russia, but rather in Mexico. Not only were socialist measures put in place like seizures of private property, the nationalization of industry, but also a direct attack against the only rival to the revolution, the Catholic Church. A faithful Catholic from Mexico during that time of persecution and trouble, said the following, We are going to die, and we will not see victory. But Mexico needs all this blood for its purification. Christ will receive the homage which is due to him, unquote. How similar that is to that French priest. It is a law that the church cannot take a step forward, but at the cost of the life of her children. The blood of martyrs is the seed of future Christians. Our Blessed Mother had made an appearance, as we know, to St. Juan Diego in the year 1531 and left upon his very shirt, his tilma, a miraculous image of Our Lady Guadalupe painted with the heavenly brush from being a pagan land where literally human sacrifice was offered regularly Mexico became a place where the unbloody sacrifice of the mass was offered daily upon the altar. Christ became king of Mexico, and yes, the Virgin of Guadalupe became the queen. The devil was not pleased, however, with his exile from Mexico, and so he came back. The devil does come back. And he came back to Mexico with seven other demons to topple Christ the king, and Holy Church from their rightful thrones. The leaders of the Mexican Revolution in the early part of the 20th century were socialists. They were atheists. Of course, they were Freemasons. That goes without saying. And they were rabidly anti-Catholic. They seized Catholic churches and made them into Masonic lodges. They suppressed all religious orders. Every revolution in a Catholic country seeks to destroy religious life. Get rid of the nuns, get rid of the monks. They also closed down all sorts of religious properties, institutions. They confiscated religious items. 
In addition, they tried to force priests to swear an oath to an ungodly socialistic constitution. And they tried to force them to register in order that they might have the privilege of ministering within the state of Mexico and seeking to indoctrinate the mind of the youth. (laughs) All Catholic schools were shut down. All Mexican children were then forced to attend public schools in which they were forced to take classes on atheism, sex education, interesting, and as always, evolution. Whenever communists in China took over certain parts of China, the first class they taught was not on Karl Marx, was not on Lenin, it was always on evolution. Believe we come from beasts and you can treat other people like beasts. Furthermore, Protestant missionaries, interesting. Protestant missionaries were invited into the country to open churches and to open schools, all invited in by the government in order to weaken the Catholic identity of the people. And finally, the communist atheistic revolution in Mexico would found a new patriotic Catholic church while the true church was largely hidden and underground. Some of the leaders of the revolution included a governor named Tomas Canabal, who handed out business cards with the following phrase printed in bold ink, quote, personal enemy of God, unquote. This same leader, Tomas Canabal, named his three boys Lucifer, Satan, and Lenin. And when the infamous Mexican president President Plutarco Elias Calles took office. He announced that he, quote, had a personal hatred for Christ. That was at his inaugural address, a personal hatred for Christ. The wrath of these revolutionary men was great. They burned countless churches and they shot those Catholics who tried to put the fires out. They desecrated sanctuaries. They destroyed statues and they used consecrated chalices as drinking mugs. They cut off priests' hands so they could no longer offer the Mass. And yes, these revolutionary men executed any and all who would resist change. But all this time, Catholic men, both peasants and, yes, professionals, Catholic men who loved their family, their faith, their farms, and their little villages began to rise up. The revolutionaries were making war on God, and his holy church, and therefore armed conflict was actually just and good. Using machetes, other farming instruments, and a small amount of guns, these men fought back. And they began a Catholic counter-revolution against a well-armed, U.S.-backed and funded revolutionary government. And the motto of these men, as many of you know, the cry that often came forth from their lips, even while facing a firing squad, was Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. And so often was this cry heard by the revolutionaries that they disdainfully called these Catholic men the Cristo Reis or the Cristeros. Though their churches were closed and most of their priests were forced into exile, these Catholic men consecrated themselves to the sacred heart of Jesus. They prayed their rosaries daily, and they always made acts of contrition before and going into battle. And the Catholics of Mexico suffered greatly during the 1920s and 1930s, but they witnessed with their blood. One man, while being hung in execution, managed to loosen the noose around his neck and cried out, Viva Cristo Rey! Another Catholic man was told that if he cried out, long live Calles and the revolution, that he would be saved from death. Without flinching, the man cried out, Viva Cristo Rey. And he had his tongue cut out as a punishment. But even with his tongue cut out, unable to speak, he pointed to the skies to witness to his king before being shot to death. And of course, there is the tremendous example of that 14-year-old boy, Cristeros, known as Blessed Jose Luis Sanchez de Rio. Blessed Jose told his mother, 14 years old, mind you, Mom, in order to go to heaven, we have to go to war. This teenager would act as a flag bearer in an army of Christ in Mexico that would rise up against the revolution. 
During one particular battle, a Cristero's general lost his horse and was in danger of capture. Blessed Jose, 14 years old, immediately told the general to take his horse in order to save himself. Although the general at first refused, of course, the boy insisted. The general escaped and would fight again the next day. But Jose Luis was soon captured and was incarcerated. He was brought to a local church that had been turned into a jail. And as people passed by the church, they could hear him praying the rosary and singing songs to the Virgin of Guadalupe. The church not only acted as a jail, but also a chicken coop for expensive fighting roosters that were owned by a local Freemason. Jose cried out, as only a true Catholic would, the house of God is not a barnyard. And he literally killed every rooster. The official was enraged, and he ordered the immediate execution of Blessed Jose. And as they led him towards execution, the soldiers began to strike them with their machetes. And yes, they even chopped off the soles of his feet. Witnesses said that the stones where Blessed Jose walked were soaked with his blood. Although weak and in great pain, Little Jose was resolved to embrace martyrdom by his special grace. And when they got to the place of execution, the soldiers sought to tempt the youngster one last time that if he said death to Christ the King, he would be spared. Jose's response, as we well know, was a resounding viva Cristore. At this point, the soldiers fired. Blessed Jose fell to the ground. And his last act while alive on earth was signing the sign of the cross, using his finger and his own blood for ink. But despite all these stories of martyrdom, the Cristeros begin to win battle after battle after battle until 75% of Mexican territory was in the hands of the counter-revolution. And the Masonic government, the revolutionaries, begged for terms of peace. Bishops... Even the Pope himself, Pius XI, were involved in negotiations with the Mexican state. Peace and amnesty were agreed to. Gentlemen's agreement that those devils in the government were liars, just like their father in hell. And as soon as they were able, they tracked down nearly every Cristeros and put them to death, hanging them along telephone wires. It is a law that the church cannot take a step forward, but at the cost of the life of her children, because the blood of martyrs is the seed of future Christians. Now, over the last few decades, Catholics within the United States have been singled out and even attacked by revolutionaries within this government. This includes closing down Catholic orphanages because of the refusal to submit to the ungodly, unjust policies of placing young orphans into the abusive care of same-gender couples. Holy Church is still having to endure trials connected with the so-called HHS mandate coming forth from the federal government and realize that these same sorts of mandates have been coming forth from state governments, many like New York, for many years. These unjust commands that demand that Catholic institutions facilitate and fund sinful things, sinful practices, such as abortion-causing drugs, direct sterilizations, and contraceptives. This human mandate, this unjust order, is a direct attack against the mystical body of Christ, and also an attack against her liberty, because the church has religious liberty for freedom to do her God-given job, which is to spread the gospel and to save the souls of men. Because we have a divine mandate, not a human mandate. We have a divine command, a God-given mandate that is above all the commands of any human governors or legislatures or judges. And that divine mandate, this God-given authorization to the Catholic Church alone, is to baptize all men, to preach the gospel, and to bring men salvation. And so therefore, no man, not even a really powerful man, 
can ever limit, can ever limit in any way whatsoever the church's holy mission. When one attacks the spiritual body of Christ, which is the church, one attacks Christ himself. All these human mandates are a slap in the face of the Son of God. And let us pray that, at least in the federal government, this new administration will finally repeal these horrible mandates. Now, I freely admit it's obvious that things are not the same troubles that were in Mexico in years past. But there are ominous signs that should wake us up to the potential dangers to the Catholic faith. Now that we live in Egypt, now that we live in Babylon, now that we live in Jericho and Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me provide two particular examples of persecution against Roman Catholics within our country. Father Norman Westland was a holy priest who died back in 2012. Father Norman Wesson was the former head of a pro-life group known as the Lambs of Christ. And they would peacefully protest in front of abortion clinics. In the past protests, the Lambs of Christ would always pray silently. And they would even take the fetal position in front of the doors of these clinics. You see, they wish to imitate the baby in the womb who has no voice and is in danger. The baby in the womb who is curled up hoping to find safe refuge within its mother's womb. Father Westland was arrested on many, many occasions and actually spent most of his priestly life in jail, always for the cause of protecting life. Just a few years ago, you may have seen him in the news because this priest of God was arrested at Notre Dame University for simply praying the rosary on his knees in protest of the most pro-death pro-abortion president in history, being given a pulpit and an honorary law degree at a graduation ceremony. It is amazing that a Catholic priest, for praying the rosary, is arrested on the Catholic campus. Father Roman Weston is also a Native American. He was also a retired colonel in the United States Air Force, and he fought with valor and distinction in the Korean conflict. A few years back, Father Weston was in jail for peacefully protesting against the crime of abortion. The guards insisted that he not eat outside of mealtimes. During the day, a fellow priest came to him in his cell and came with the most blessed sacrament, bringing him Holy Communion. The guards saw Father Weston receive the sacred host upon his tongue. The priest had broken the arbitrary rules of the prison guards. The guards immediately invaded the cell and demanded that he spit out what was in his mouth. The priest, of course, refused to do such a sacrilegious act with the blessed Lord within him. The guards then proceeded to beat Father Westland for his quote-unquote disobedience. Father Westland witnessed to the point of suffering all in imitation of Christ. But another example, and a final example, if I may. Kim Davis. Kim Davis was elected as a county clerk by the voters of Rowan County in eastern Kentucky. Part of Kim's duties were the issuance of official wedding licenses to those couple who would like to marry. Like the Samaritan woman at the well mentioned in St. John's Holy Gospel, Kim Davis had had a tough life. Multiple marriages, multiple divorces. But in 2011, Kim Davis experienced a religious awakening of sorts, following her mother-in-law's dying wish that she somehow get back to religion. Davis accepted her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the best way she knew how. Davis began to attend a Pentecostal chapel, which included participating in services three times a week. She also joined objectively in teaching the gospel in some way, the best way she knew how, in local jails. She stopped wearing makeup and jewelry. She began to wear longer skirts. And yes, she began to live the faith in the best way she knew how at the time. 
But things would change drastically in her life in the summer of 2015. Because on June 26, 2015, in a horrible day in the nation's history, our White House, the executive branch house, was lit up with rainbow colors in commemoration of the Supreme Court's decision to legalize sodomitical marriages. That put the final nail in the coffin of the institution of matrimony. But not too far away from the White House, which was coated with rainbow colors, one saw the Supreme Court building, along with those words above the main entrance, equal justice under the law. But if you actually venture inside the Supreme Court building, take a tour, you will notice large bronze doors that have the Ten Commandment tablets emblazoned and engraved upon them. And if you actually go into the Supreme Court room where the judges sit, behind the bench where those nine justices are, there are bas-reliefs, special sculptures of a number of famous lawgivers, including a picture of Holy Moses holding one of the tablets and pointing to the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And yes, other images behind the bench where the justices sit show a procession of the 18 greatest lawgivers in human history, including King Solomon, the great emperor Charlemagne, and yes, the holy king of France, St. Louis IX. But on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court irrationally ruled against nature and ruled against nature's God. And in a ruling called Obergefell versus Hodges, the nation's highest court ruled that the fundamental, quote-unquote, right to marry is guaranteed to such couples by a due process clause, an equal protection clause in the 14th Amendment. Following this ridiculous, ludicrous, and impious ruling, 18 counties and three states, including Alabama, Texas, and yes, Kentucky, continued to refuse same-sex couples their licenses. And that included Rowan County, where Kim Davis was the county clerk. On one particular morning, two men approached and asked for a wedding license, vowing to stay all day unless Kim compromised. Kim Davis said, you're going to have an awful long day. The men had already been sent away four times, and other like-minded revolutionaries who would try to force her to comply were sent away. She was called a bigot. She was yelled at. She was told that she should be ashamed of her presidential ways. But Kim Davis held her ground against her accusers. I'm willing to face my consequences, she said. Are you willing to face yours? When judgment comes, I'll face my consequences. It's plain and simple. Judge David Bunning, also from Kentucky, is a Roman Catholic. Judge Bunning is the son of the famous former Major League Baseball pitcher and also former U.S. Senator Jim Bunning. This Catholic judge, mind you, dismissed the superiority of the eternal law of God and the natural law and sentenced Kim Davis to jail on contempt of court charges for refusing to enforce the Supreme Court decision. In ancient days, it was pagan emperors and pagan governors that put Christians in jail. But in this modern age, Pharaoh has baptized people perform his persecution of the baptized. Judge Bunning followed the golden calf, and he ruled in favor of those plaintiffs who live a San Francisco lifestyle and held Kim Davis in contempt. She then went to jail. But before she was booked, photographed, and incarcerated, Kim Davis stated, and this is something that should come to everybody's mind, she said, I never imagined a day like this would ever come. When I would be asked to violate a central teaching of Scripture, of natural law, and of Jesus himself regarding marriage, to issue a marriage license, note her 
strength here, to issue a marriage license which conflicts with God's definition of marriage, with my name affixed to it, would violate everything I believe in. Pope Leo XIII of holy memory, and this should be memorized by every Catholic, he said, if the laws of the state are manifestly at variance with the divine law, the laws of the state are against the laws of God, Truly to resist becomes a duty, and to obey becomes a crime. It is interesting that pro-illegal immigration activists are praised in the press. Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., and other civil rights leaders have become highly respected figures, even icons in a liberal pantheon. But Kim Davis has largely been condemned for upholding the divine and natural law, and she's been put in jail by cold-hearted justices. It seems that since we live in a very unchaste, impure, and immodest society, one can't expect a contracepting nation, a sterilizing nation, to condemn the abomination of sodomy. Those black-robed justices who voted in the majority, cannot overturn the unchangeable laws of God. The laws of Egypt do not trump the laws of God. The Supreme Court decision, therefore, is ultimately annulled, rejected by the divine judge in the heavenly court above, because he's the judge. And therefore, we should reject also the justice's ruling. In fact, we like Kim Davis, ought to be in contempt of court, to be contemptuous of this present-day court that plays God and mocks the divine order of things. The same court that legalized the killing of unborn children now tells us that two men can wed. Do they really have any more legitimacy? St. Augustine said, an unjust law is not a law. Again, we haven't reached the level of persecution, obviously, as seen in Mexico in the 20th century, but there are ominous signs. How long will it be before a Catholic chaplain in the armed services will be ordered by higher-ups to officiate at a sodomitical marriage or face sanctions or court-martial? Those leading Egypt today have an agenda and they want to impose this agenda upon the citizenry. And considering that a number of us, a number of Christians, baptized people, voted for referendums to recognize this abomination in certain states, there doesn't seem to be much resistance. And perhaps we have not seen real hardship as they did in Mexico, or real trial as they did to a neighbor of our South, because most Catholics compromise. We don't resist. Most of us are stuck in Egypt, and Egypt is stuck in us. In fact, many of us even vote for Pharaoh every four years. We're building his cities. We're supporting his policies as slaves. But if we do resist, if we do beginning making an exodus out of Egypt, if we start climbing Mount Sinai and proclaim the Ten Commandments as the law of this land, We'll see persecution then. And it will start small. Revolutions, persecutions always begin by mocking Christians. Mocking, insulting, ridiculing the faithful. That's already happened. It happens every day in the news. Every day on television. Mockery of the Christian faith. But then maybe Pharaoh will no longer supply us with the straw that we need to build our cities with his bricks that's forcing to gather for ourselves. Perhaps the IRS will drop uh, the sort of free exercise clause mentioned in the Constitution and will say to diocesan and chanceries, it's time to pay up. No more tax-free stuff. And for those priests who actually do stand up and actually do proclaim the Ten Commandments and the laws of old, perhaps they will be charged with hate speech. How long will it be before various Catholic hospitals 
charitable agencies, and educational institutes fall completely under the control of secular authorities. Egypt is expanding, and where can we find refuge? You know, I turned 52 years old last November. And in these last few decades, I have seen my country drastically change. There's no longer a basic moral consensus that unites us. Many leaders speak about the importance of civility during this time of moral diversity. But how can there be civility between us and them when they support the most uncivilized, ungodly behaviors imaginable? You see, we're not just slouching towards Gomorrah, as Judge Bork's book once put it. We're not just racing towards Gomorrah. Dear people, we are actually in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where we live. We live there with Lot and his wife and his family. You see, in ancient days, barbarians were outside the gates and they were threatening Christian towns and villages with invasion. But now the barbarians have actually conquered. And they've been ruling us for years. The barbarians control the culture. And it's a culture of impurity, death, and despair. And so since we do live in a spiritual Egypt, with its idolatries and evils, many people want to flee to some distant place on the map for a natural refuge. I've heard that some want to move to Malta, supposedly the last Catholic country on earth. <laughs> But with what the bishops did recently regarding Holy Communion for those in objective, adulterous situations, <laughs> Malta's lost its Catholicity too. Others want to go off the grid, somehow hide from authorities, building underground shelters with food supplies, guns, and ammunition to last for months, even years. But these places of natural refuge are ultimately not the answer. The tentacles of Egypt have a far reach. As Catholics, we don't want a place of natural refuge so much, but rather a location that will provide supernatural refuge and protection. We want a Noah's Ark that will save us and our families, helping us to rise above the flood of moral corruption. We want a spiritual cave in the rock that we can dwell in. Well, this heavenly place is available to all Catholics and to all men for that matter. This supernatural refuge is found in the most sacred heart of Jesus and the rock of ages, which is Christ. Dear people, we have supernatural weapons at our disposal. We have supernatural life, the interior life of grace. They don't. You know, our dear Lord, just with Moses' staff, split the Red Sea in half in a moment. When the Jews in Jerusalem were being attacked by the Assyrians and Sennacherib, the Assyrian general, was going to destroy Jerusalem, the Jews prayed. And our Lord sent angels in the middle of the night and slew 185,000 Assyrians. And they fled. Almost 2,000 years ago, on a Friday that we call good, our blessed Savior died upon the holy wood of the cross. And a final act occurred just a little past 3 p.m. when his holy side and sacred heart was opened, pierced by the Roman centurion named St. Longinus. He wanted to determine if Christ was actually dead, which he was. This piercing of Christ's heart, however, brought forth wondrous things. Not only did water and blood flow from his sacred side, giving us through the church sacramental power and grace, but a hole. A hole was opened up in that same heart, and that hole is still there today. It hasn't closed. A gate of life is open for us. An entrance way that we can walk through has been established in the heart of Jesus since that Good Friday because he was wounded for us. 
We now have passageway that leads to supernatural refuge and protection. We do now have a cave. And we can dwell in that cave during dark times. We have more than Noah's Ark here. The doorway in the heart of Christ will save more than just Noah's family and two of every kind of beast. The hole in this living, beating ark is wide and it can take in all humanity. In this heart, you will find supernatural refuge and protection. You will be free from external troubles. You will find love within that heart, devotion inside, a mine shaft of true gold. You'll find virtues in abundance. And yes, you will find many riches in the chambers of that heart. You'll find contrition for your sins and ultimately salvation itself. You will find Christ's heart to be a holy land and it will keep you free from Egypt. Persecution may come. Now we know where to go. The St. Augustine, the church father, the greatest of all church fathers, put it, and I'll end with his quotation. He said, And now let us all come who love paradise, a place of peace, of security, and perpetual happiness, a place where we will fear no barbarian, we will endure no adversary, a place where we will suffer no enemy. Come all, enter all, There is a way by which you may enter, because the side of Christ is open for you. Strive, says the Lord, to enter by the narrow gate. But what is more narrow, Augustine says, than that hole which one of the soldiers opened by striking the side of the crucified? And yet through this narrow hole, almost the whole world has entered. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.